Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Dr. Jackson Crawford. This video is not just Patreon supported, but Patreon requested, as it is one in a series of monthly videos that are actually voted on by my Patreon supporters. This topic about daily life in the Middle Ages for the Norse is going to consist of a fair amount of inferences from literature and a fair amount of inferences from the reality of rural life today. I am not an archaeologist, as I have said a hundred times on this channel, so I'm not going to focus on things like what somebody's comb might be made of or what kind of spindle whorls someone would use in weaving, because that's really not my domain. Instead, I want to kind of help you get into the headspace of things that are different, whether expectedly or unexpectedly, for someone living in this culture and living in the daily realities of life in Viking Age Scandinavia. To start with, let me give you three thoughts right up top that I think are important to shaping expectations of the Viking Age and of many other pre-modern societies. Here's one, sex causes babies. This is something that in today's society, certainly in the United States and Europe, people don't necessarily think about. Sex often has nothing to do with children for people today. Um, contraception is so widely available and so effective that sex that produces children is almost an exception. But for the Vikings, sex caused children. Now, that means that the social politics around the relations of men and women are quite different because there is really no such thing as casual sex when any sex causes dependence. <laughs> uh, at least you have to assume that it might. This is part of why relations between men and women can sometimes seem so guarded in the sagas, why families are so protective of their daughters, their sisters, uh, their wives, etc. Because, of course, when you have more dependence, you have more responsibilities, and they have responsibilities toward you carrying on your legacy. You want to make sure that you know the people you're related to and that the proper people have the proper responsibilities to the proper people. So probably you'd be living in a family unit that might be smaller, might be larger. At a minimum, you'd probably have the parents and their kids. Let's say if the parents have been married for a decade or so, you might have three or four kids running around. Probably more than that have been born, but a lot of kids are going to die very early because of disease especially. If you're a little bit wealthier, or if just the dice fall out in that particular way, you might actually have quite a few more people living with you, maybe a dozen, maybe 20. They might be extended family. They might be hired hands. They might be slaves. And slaves, of course, uh, don't think about plantation owners on the Natchez Trace. Um, people often do on the internet because either that's all they can think of in terms of slavery is, is American slavery in, in the 18th, 19th century, um, or because, you know, they're wannabe Nazis and, 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 and try to project their modern, semi-modern racism back onto the Middle Ages, which is pretty inapt. Th slaves are really just more powerless people than you. Slaves may even be sort of related to you. They may be people from pretty close by, um, but they're people who have no power whatsoever for whatever reason. They're captured in war. They are uh, perhaps people who owe quite a bit, or they're just people who are so powerless or their families are so powerless that nobody's worried about forcing them to do stuff. And if they have no other option to eat, they're going to stick around and, and do that stuff, especially if everybody else around regards them as the property of somebody else and would just bring them back to that person. Slavery in the Middle Ages in a fairly unorganized society like this 
really is a matter of fairly, it's, it's fairly a matter of pecking order more than the organized racially distinguishing uh, system you might think of from, from the history of American slavery. But I'm, I'm wandering away from my point that sex causes children. I just want to set up a notion of households that have a, a younger basic uh, average age than possibly we do today because not as many people have children, people don't have as many children, and they probably have children fairly late relative to medieval people. But also to understand who else would be in the household with them. All right, a second thing. The Norse are very concerned with manliness because we confuse the Vikings not just with maybe southern plantation owners, but with the Spartans. We often think of that manliness in terms of, I don't know, Leonidas. People think that every Viking man, every Norse man of the Viking age is a Viking. He is a fighter, raider, a professional warrior. That really isn't a good mental image to have. When I say manly, Yes, that Leonidas warrior thing is part of that. People are gonna people are gonna fight a lot. Probably any given man is going to have a share of, of injuries from fighting. He's gonna have weapons ready at hand. But that's mostly going to be it's a strange way of putting it, but somewhat more casual fighting than I think you're expecting. Disputes with neighbors, someone insulting you, uh, raids on weaker people across the sea, perhaps that kind of thing. Not so much because he's you know, part of some organized regiment. So when I say manly, the first thing you should think of is not Leonidas. The first thing you should think of is probably more like Red Green, right? A handyman, a man who can be depended on to do the things that support his family and maintain his farm or whatever other means he has for sustaining himself. He, he might be wealthy enough that he actually controls other people's uh, farms and agricultural outputs. A man is someone who supports his family well, does not engage in anything that might cause him shame, and is ready to fight, but probably isn't fighting all the time, and isn't getting paid for it. This is something he's got to do sometimes, just like sometimes you got to restart the fire. <laughs> and then a third thing that I want to emphasize right up top is that everything is hard. There is no, uh, there's, there's really not luxury in a society like this. Think of how easy it is for us to do just about anything, right? Certainly if you live in the United States in um, the early 21st century, um, as I do as I'm, as I'm talking about this, it is not that hard to stay alive. Now, there's always going to be things that are kind of conspiring against you staying alive. You might be in a car wreck. You might be so unfortunate as to contract uh, cancer or some other kind of disease. But day to day, until you get somewhere in your 80s, you kind of expect that you're going to wake up the next morning. That is not necessarily a medieval expectation. There are so many more diseases that they have no ability to uh, control or remediate. I mean, just consider how difficult it would be to live with diabetes in the Middle Ages, right? Children um, are going to have are, are are going to get rambunctious. They're going to explore. They're going to fall down wells. <laughs> I don't know. Not to not to be too lassy about this, but kids are going to get themselves into scrapes that are going to get them killed, right? If if they're not killed by just having measles when they're young and, and there's no vaccines. Um, men are going to be expected to be ready to fight, to defend their honor, defend their family, um, and might well get killed real early on uh, just from a wound that gets infected. And women are going to be pregnant all the time, right? Imagine that, ladies. Again, sex causes children. And from complications of pregnancy, from complications of birth, uh, they're going to die. And presumably also, uh, you know, people may, <laughs> speaking of the fantasy people project onto Vikings, sometimes you get this sort of feminist fantasy projected onto them. That's really not very true. I imagine a lot of Norse men were not particularly great husbands. And uh, there could also be casualties for women in that way. You 
are fighting to stay alive, right? And these th threats of death are right are on top of the fact that you've got to work your moccasins off to keep the fire lit, to eat, to <laughs> to collect water, to make sure the water or whatever you're drinking is sanitary, to build your house, to maintain your house, um, to make sure your neighbors. Uh, think you're strong and so they're not coming to take your stuff to take care of your livestock whether that be horses cows and or sheep and or pigs and or just your dogs to make your weapons um, or to do whatever surplus activity you need to to buy weapons to to go out raiding which you need a ship you need oars you need to know how to do a lot of things you got to be a jack of all trades and you got to have a lot of energy and there's no B6 vitamins <laughs> at the grocery store, right, in the vitamin market. You gotta just, and there's no coffee, right? You just gotta get up and you gotta work your moccasins off from dawn to dusk and then after. All right, having made those three big points right up top, let's look at a few more particular things about life in the Viking Age. Now, life for everyone in a pre-modern time, and for most people in modern times, except a lucky some, is mostly work. So what kind of daily work is there to do? And how is it different from different members of the household? Well, remember that human beings, regardless of their material circumstances or culture, have some basic needs. You gotta stay warm, which means fire, in a pre-modern society, you know, there's no, <laughs> no floorboards or anything like that. If you want to stay warm in the winter, you got to chop, store, start, and tend to fire, which is a familiar chore to some of us today, but a de decreasingly uh, a familiar chore to people today. If you want to eat, well, depending on what you're eating, if you've got vegetables, you got to tend them or gather them. you got to store them somehow. you got to cook them. For meat, you gotta kill the animal. If it's domestic, you gotta raise it in the first place. If it's wild, you gotta hunt it in the first place. You gotta process the corpse. You gotta store the meat somehow. You gotta cook the meat somehow. All of this takes a lot of time. If you wanna have a roof over your head, you gotta chop wood again. <laughs> you gotta know a fair amount. I mean, it's it's a it's a skilled profession building houses and probably people are mostly building their own houses at this time. I mean, I think that's a really underestimated uh, uh, chore or, um, or, or time expenditure, especially for men, is building and maintaining residences and other buildings. The fundamental distinction between men's and women's work is probably mostly outdoor versus indoor. Men are expected to work outdoors women are expected to do most of the work inside the house. When a woman is married, or at least a woman of status, we see often that she is said to wear keys, which seems to signify her, um, her dominion within the house, within the keyed area. Men are also usually praised for having um, sun-colored sun skin. The uh, favorable term for that is Ryother. If you're a little too uh, sunburned, if you look, you know, a little bit uh, abused by the sun, you got some more negative terms uh, for that. Uh, Solmer uh, is one. Yarper, if it's not applied to hair, seems to possibly be one of those. Um, and so you often see that uh, a slave, a man who basically has to work outside no matter what and whatever conditions is going to be described by these sort of negative terms for sunburn, whereas a man who's active outdoors but doesn't look worse for it, looks better, you know, more like some tanned, um, will be described as, as, as a rio, they're like ruddy. Uh, whereas women are described favorably if they are pale. That's actually a pretty common thing. Terms for, for pale imply that a man is... Um, a coward, but they imply that a woman is um, wealthy enough that she doesn't have to go outside to do uh, what should rightly be men's work. She's got men in her family, presumably her husband or others, who do that work so she can stay 
doing proper women's things inside, and then she's regarded as being more attractive because she's not um, sunned. Of course, this is pretty different from our culture. Um, I guess this varies from decade to decade, but um, you know, certainly I think that a lot of men today, uh, we regard women as more attractive if, if they are suntanned, right, rather than, than super pale. Uh, this is another thing, of course, that plays into, uh, you know, internet racist narratives. Often those people are using really old translations that use terms like swarthy for the slaves who work outside and get sunburned. That's a pretty bad translation of what I think is better translated as just sunburned. Um, I don't know, you know, I barely know what swarthy means. I don't know anybody who says that. But people, you know, internet racists take that to mean, um, you know, darker skinned peoples because, again, they can't get you know, U.S. South plantations out of their head. Um, another thing about women's work is that it's going to be focused on, it, 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 if, if we've got this outdoor versus indoor um, split between men's and women's work, we've also kind of got a situation where men get stuff and women maintain stuff. So it's the man who goes out and gets the food. He's the one who's probably doing most of the farming, the hunting, the animal husbandry, that kind of thing, where it's the woman who is taking care of that stuff on, on the inside. Um, she's the one who does the cooking. She's the one who cleans stuff. She makes clothing. She probably deals with the, um, what I guess you could call kind of the vanity task for most members of the family. It's women who are going to be doing things like cutting hair. Uh, in fact, that's considered a very prototypical women's job. Women are, of course, taking care of human beings inside the house. There's going to be children around. Women are taking care of the children. They're probably taking care of any elderly members of the family who are around, sick members of the family who are around, that kind of thing. That's going to be women's work. Women seem to do the brewing. Uh, that's kind of interesting, maybe a little bit different from what people would expect today, but that seems to be part of a woman's domain. Men working outside are then gonna be divided somewhat by class. There's a real, um, it's, a, it's a real powerful insult to call a man of high status. Uh, anything that has to do with taking care of sheep, pigs, or dogs. So apparently, um, even though of course, wealthy farms might have those animals around, uh, the care of them is considered a low class kind of job. And so uh, men would probably leave that to their uh, low hirelings or their slaves. Whereas, of course, touching horses and cattle, taking care of, of those higher status animals seems fine and even commendable for uh, an upper status man. That's actually not too different from uh, at least agricultural areas in the west of the U.S. where cattle and horses have high status and sheep often have very low status. Uh, but that may be for different uh, historical contextual reasons. Children are probably going to be working pretty early. I would think that would be fairly um, low intensity work as it often is on farms today. Children are probably gathering eggs, whether from domestic or wild fowl. Children might be going out to the well or to the river, what have you, to get water. Children might be maintaining the fire inside the house. Uh, that kind of fairly simple work um, you would imagine being passed off to children. Although. Of course, children, especially of a very young age, would also be expected to spend some time at play. And on certain days and during the evenings, adults would be able to participate in entertainments as well. I find that people today often have one of two contradictory opinions about entertainment in uh, the Viking Age or for other ancient and medieval people. One of those opinions, the sort of simpler one that maybe is a little bit more correct, is that people never had any fun, that they were always working. And yeah, they probably were working a lot more than your average person in 21st century America does. And that's a lot sometimes. On the other hand, you have people, and this tends to be the kind of person who has been spending their entire life trying to recapture the feeling of when they saw the Lord of the Rings in theaters the first time. It thinks everybody in pre-industrial life felt that way all the time, and nobody felt that way all the time, right? People got bored just as much in the Middle Ages as they get bored now, maybe more, but they still did things for fun. Now, I'll refer you to another video for a little bit more detail 
on uh, some of the outdoor entertainments. Um, we know they had a ball game. It's called in the saga simply Knat Laker Ball Game. We're not clear on exactly all of the rules and regulations, as it were, and they probably vary from place to place, but it seems to have been kind of a combination of hockey and lacrosse. They also had horse fights. That was a big spectacle and entertainment you could invite people to, right? I've got a mare in heat. I've got a stallion. You bring your stallion. We'll have our stallions fight over the mare. That's something that uh, sometimes even a plot point in the sagas, such as in the story of Thorstein Stickbeat. I've also have, uh, made a video about that uh, in discussing the concept of drengskap or manliness. They had uh, indoor entertainments too, probably the best known, and I also discussed it in that one video about Norse sports and games from a couple years back, is the one called uh, Nevatavl. There's also some other related names for it. A chess-ish game. Um, although the two sides aren't evenly matched, one side is defending a king piece and another side is trying to attack that king piece, uh, getting through the opponent pieces that guard that piece. Anyway, it's played on a board, a little bit like a chess game. Again, we're not in a position to know all of the exact rules, but, but chess-like. And then I think one of the biggest entertainments we forget about is the simple joy of music and the word. Now, unfortunately, we actually don't know very much about Viking Age music. The earliest music from Scandinavia that we know is the one little ditty from the Codex Runicus, uh, which, of course, becomes the famous song, uh, My Drende and Drem uh, in Denmark, I Dreamed a Dream. Uh, I have a video about that little ditty also. Uh, but we don't have otherwise recorded music unless poems were sung, which they might have been. Um, we don't have uh, musical notation before the Codex Runicus ditty. Uh, so we just don't really know that much about what their music sounded like. Um, which is unfortunate because no doubt people were making music uh, during the long Scandinavian winter nights. I think that we underestimate just what a... Uh, just what a nice community experience making music together can be. You know, for us when, I don't know, Uncle Kent brings his guitar over, you know, we might groan and say, oh man, I don't want to hear this guy play the guitar. I'd much rather just, you know, listen to something on, on my computer. But of course, they have no ability to just listen to something. And so the best musicians they're probably ever going to hear are just their random family musicians, people who just you know, play in their off hours. Um, and it's probably a lot of fun, right? You know, this is the only time you're gonna really hear music is when you get together and, and, and play with other people. I think we underestimate what a big deal that probably was, partially because we just, you know, were so ill-informed about their specific music. But poetry too. In a society like this, poetry isn't just, I mean, you know, poetry is nothing like this to us. Um, the closest thing would be something like, like song and to, to a certain extent, um, novels and movies. Poetry is how they tell stories. And it's also a way to keep your mind occupied when you're doing a lot of other work, right? You know, you're plowing, you're nailing, you're chopping, you're making a fence. And, um, you know, just reciting poetry to yourself, trying to remember a poem that you've heard or to compose a new poem is one way you can keep your mind occupied. Um, and it's so different from the task you're doing with your hands, it doesn't really distract you from it. And then to share poetry at night, whether, again, it's something you heard or something you made, uh, would be a nice, a nice family experience. Uh, and also probably one of the reasons why they're so excited to see guests, because, hey, there's probably new poetry, right? Someone visiting from wherever else or just traveling through probably knows a poem or two that we haven't heard maybe knows a different version of a poem or can remind us about something we haven't been thinking about for a while, you know, some poem we just sort of let slide out of our repertoire. I think you probably have a fairly um, fairly high standard, actually, of poetic memory and even composition, even among pretty average middle-class people, just because that's such an accessible and... Uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? And... Uh, it's too bad that, you know, I can't just go back and, and uh, I'll record over myself later. 
because that would sound so so goofy, but I'll just stick with the word important uh, practice because, of course, poets are very highly prized in Norse society. And you look at poets in the sagas, and they are some of the, I mean, they are the, the, the celebrities the, and, and, and the prima donnas of their day. And the poetry that we see them composing just on the fly in a saga is of a very high standard. I mean, I would say basically impossible uh, for poets today. But then you see musicians today uh, who improv, musician singers, uh, rappers, whatever, who, who improv a fair amount of music, a fair amount of lyrics. Um, I think that people who, who had a good skill at this probably actually did have pretty amazing improv, pretty amazing on the cuff abilities, and probably also kept kind of stored up uh, certain lyrics uh, in their head. They were waiting for the right moment to deliver. Uh, certain kinnings, they might be waiting for the right moment to deliver. Don't underestimate how much um, sharing music and sharing poetry probably was a big part of what your average Norse man and Norse woman looked forward to while they went about their chores during the day. Two things that go together in Norse culture as in any culture are status and prejudice. People want to enforce their own status, and that means associating with people of that status or a higher status, and demeaning people of lower status to keep them in their place. Now, the signals of status are sometimes subtle and sometimes very obvious. In our culture, they tend a little more toward the subtle, All right? This is a culture today that has a certain amount of irony uh, built into us, a sense of irony. Now, of course, uh, if you use Twitter, you know that uh, not everybody has a sense of irony and some people take everything literally, but we're a culture where a very beautiful woman is not necessarily assumed to be rich not necessarily assumed to be especially moral, not necessarily assumed uh, to be from a uh, very noble family extraction, something like that. Um, her status, may, her, her beauty may be, may, 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 uh, may give her status, but she may not have other status symbols, right? I think you could be I think you could find beautiful women who are fairly low status today. That really probably would not be the case in Norse society because all symbols of status go together. At least in their literature, that's how they talk, right? So if there is a slave in a story, the slave is going to be called bad, right? I mean, sometimes like there's actually, a, for example, I'm, I'm thinking of a particular scene in the saga of Hervor and Heiderik where a slave is just randomly called bad a few times. It, it, it just seems to be because he's a slave. Uh, slaves and other people of low status will typically be des described as ugly. If something of low character is done, it's probably done by someone who has other um, fairly obvious quote unquote bad things about them, like they're fairly ugly or they're poor. Everything kind of goes together for them. Um, and the symbols of status are fairly obvious. Beautiful people are higher status because, of course, probably they have enough status that, that they can eat well enough, they don't look malnourished. Um, and they, of course, will dress better. They will probably dress with more variety. Uh, you will notice if you read the sagas, many of the people who are described as very attractive or very wealthy, their clothes are dwelled on to some degree and often the colors of their clothes are dwelled on to some degree. Because, of course, colored clothing is fairly expensive. And in a world where people probably have, basically, most people are going to have as many clothes as they need, and it's going to be one or two sets of everything, right? They'll have a shirt, maybe two shirts. They'll have a pair of pants, maybe two pair of pants. Women might have one or two dresses. 
right, that they maybe cycle through when one is being washed, they wear the other. Uh, people who have a large variety of clothes and who can spend time getting colored clothes, getting dyed clothes, um, are going to be higher status. They're going to be uh, more wealthy. And it's interesting, you know, in, in English we have, in modern English, we have some, some remnants of a society like this in the way that we talk about things. Um, like character, right? We call people noble if they behave in particularly good ways. And of course, that goes back to a conception of nobles, people who were nobly born, being of better behavior than people who were born lower. In the same way, we talk about villains. Uh, and villain, of course, originally means someone who is, is, a, is, is a peasant. It's originally a peasant. So we still have some of that coded into our language, even though we no longer really uh, believe this for the most part, right? We certainly our literature is full of virtuous poor people and and sinister um, sinister rich people. So probably in daily life, you are projecting your status as well as you can. If you're wealthy, you're wearing nice clothes. You are. Uh, as I mentioned in the chores section, you're not doing things associated with the lower class, like maybe tending lower class animals, pigs, sheep. And lower class people are being probably constantly put in their place. They're being probably berated by the people they work for to some degree, unless their spirits are just broken and they're submissive anyway. Um, they are going to be eating differently. If you read the poem Rix Thula and the Poetic Edda, um, you will get a sense for food as a status marker. Um, when Rieger visits the poor family at the beginning of the poem, he's fed um, what I think we would call wheat bread um, with lots of stuff in it. But this is low status compared to the uh, pretty difficult to make white bread that served at the, at the rich family later in the poem. More meat certainly better quality meat will be eaten by people of higher status and people of higher status will probably be literally bigger in most respects than those of lower status. They'll be taller because they've had a better diet throughout their lives. Their skin will probably be healthier looking, perhaps not as sallow uh, because of nutritional deficiencies. They might be fatter, although Wealthy people aren't usually called, people are usually made fun of still for being fat. Men are not made fun of for being, quote unquote, digger, which is often translated stout. But that probably, you probably ought to picture more of a football player than, you know, a guy with a beer belly for that. Um, it's not exactly clear, of course, what BMI or whatever was considered attractive. Uh, to the Norse, and we probably can't recover that kind of information. But most likely, um, your poor people are going to be pretty much um, scrawny rather than slender. They're going to look malnourished for the most part. We see in the sagas constantly that um, there's an expectation that the rich uh, look better than the poor, and you can kind of tell even when they're trying to pretend. Like when in the saga of the Volsungs, after the death of Sigmund, his wife Hjordis switches clothes with her slave, and the slave pretends to be her, and she pretends to be the slave. But uh, Olv, the uh, co-king of Denmark, is very suspicious of this because the one who's pretending to be a slave just looks better. Um, and very likely there was a sense for that. And it was probably enforced just by, by body language and attitude, right? Um, I was at a banquet not too long ago that I happened to be invited to as, as a representative of CU Center of the American West. And I'm surrounded by millionaires and uh, governors, mayors, um, university presidents. And people could tell that I'm not someone of that status in ways I'm not even aware of. I don't feel like I'm behaving differently. I don't feel like my clothes look worse. But just something about the way people carry themselves when they have that kind of assurance of where their next meal is coming from, uh, I think probably shows and is pretty hard to fake. And so probably people kind of know your status at a glance. 
from the way you look, from the way you dress, from the way you carry yourself, probably to some degree from the way you talk, and from just uh, whether you talk to people as one who gives commands or as one who takes them. And uh, there was probably a certain sense that people were born to do one or the other. Um, they have very, I mean, it's so much more specific than racist. It's like familyist attitudes, right? This family has brave men. This family has beautiful women. This family um, is a family of cowards or whatever. Uh, they have very specific ideas about that. And often, um, probably from dealing with only a small selection of families, they have a pretty good idea of what family someone is from and pretty strong prejudices about um, that person, even before that person's ever opened his mouth uh, because of who he's related to. So it's a world of prides and prejudices, not too different perhaps in some ways than our own world of prides and prejudices, but with somewhat different priorities and emphases. All right, let's talk about the rhythms of life, birth, marriage, divorce, death. And I realize that, um, I realize now that putting it that way makes me sound uh, probably more than anything else I've said, like your depressed middle-aged uncle who's sitting you down to tell you his, his story. But uh, let's actually start with uh, courtship and marriage because then we can discuss the birth of children as part of that. Now, consider that when you court a woman, you are not directly courting her necessarily. You are expected, if you are a respectable young Norseman, to be making a deal with her dad. All right, you want to go to the dad and propose marriage to his daughter. You need to present yourself as a respectable man, a, a dranger. You need to present some means of making money and supporting yourself and then your prospective wife and any prospective children you might have. And you also need to, you know, present some kind of advantage that presumably the father's going to get out of this that he wouldn't get out of marrying her to some other guy with similar material means. Um, you know, if you have some, if, if perhaps your father had some crucial alliance with this guy's father, then offering to continue it into the next generation is a, a pretty good enticement, perhaps. Um, often we see in the sagas, and this could have been fairly normal in uh, real life too, that men approach the fathers of women that they want to marry, but the fathers find them a little bit too unproven so far, right? I mean, you're, you seem promising, but there's not that much that you've done. I'm going to put my daughter on a three-year kind of layaway, <laughs> right? Um, during those three years, you go out, you know, do some Viking raids, maybe serve with the king in Norway. Remember, these sagas are often written from an Icelandic perspective. And uh, then come back, and if you survived and, um, and proven yourself, then I'll marry my daughter to you. Now, the daughter is not necessarily consulted in the sagas. Um, that is always disastrous if she isn't, but she does not apparently have to be. The father, however, if he is caring and if he doesn't want some kind of disaster, uh, will typically offer the daughter a veto, right? I think that it'd be great to marry you to this guy, but I will let you uh, veto the suggestion. Now, when men just court women directly, um, that is also pretty bad um, from the perspective of this culture. So, for example, in uh, the saga of Halfred Vandre the Skald, the uh, trouble poet, Halfred uh, really likes this girl, uh, Kulfina, and he uh, makes out with her so much that the father actually approaches him and says, Hey, are you, you know, what are your intentions here? Do you want to marry my daughter? If so, you need to tell me about it and, and get married to her. But Halfred says, No, you know, I'm just. I'm just messing around, man, just having a good time. And of course, that makes the dad kind of desperate to get the daughter married off because he doesn't want her, of course, perhaps to conceive a child that then the father is going to be responsible for because the man who fathered the kid is, is out of the scene. So he goes and deliberately gets her married to someone else without talking to her, gets her engaged to someone else. Um, 
Although it's interesting to note that he approaches a friend and says, do you have any friends who could come and offer me to marry my daughter? Because it's also not really considered proper for the father to kind of make the first move and say, hey, I want to marry my daughter to you. That's considered an improper, maybe kind of forward in a strange way. Uh, the only time I think you ever see that presented well is in the saga of the Volsungs, where uh, Gyuki and Grimhildr uh, offer their daughter Guthrun to the great hero Sigurdr, but then Sigurdr is the greatest hero ever, so it makes some sense that he gets to break rules that the rest of us don't. Now, when you actually get married, we don't know much about what that ceremony is like. In fact, I remember that when uh, Disney was making Frozen, they wanted some kind of Viking marriage ceremony for me, and I didn't even know what to tell them. Part of the reason why the sagas probably don't describe marriage ceremonies is that they are written for people who are in the same culture. So in the same way that I would tell you that, you know, X and Y got married and you probably wouldn't ask me if the girl wore a white dress or if they said I do because you just assume those things, they're writing for an audience who knows how this works. And since these stories aren't uh, romances, at least not in the sense of, you know, <laughs> uh, signet paperbacks or whatever, uh, they just don't dwell on these details very much. We do know that there's a big feast. Uh, so in effect, we don't know much about the wedding, but we know quite a bit about the reception. Uh, it seems like there's quite a bit of, of partying, a lot of getting drunk, a big feast. Everybody is invited from both families and from the neighborhood. And anybody who's anybody in the area is going to come uh, witness these two get married. It's possible that there is a ceremonial um, bedding of the couple for the first time. You watch them get into their bed, uh, the bed closet together. Um, but that's not uh, necessarily a consistent part of how this is portrayed. Now, marriage can end too. Divorce is possible, and both men and women can initiate divorce, at least in the sagas. And we do have outsiders who, who comment on this. For instance, Al Tartushi, who was a, uh, a Muslim Spaniard who visited Hedeby, the Norse trading post in Denmark, about 970, commented that women, quote, married and divorced at their own desire, which uh, was certainly scandalous to him and may reflect a reality somewhat similar to the sagas where both men and women can present uh, a reason, name witnesses, and then divorce their spouse. Now, in the sagas, divorce is more often a threat than a reality where women will threaten to divorce their husbands if the husband doesn't do some particular thing the woman wants him to do, perhaps avenge a family member or something like that that the husband's been late in acting on. Because of course, if a husband is is slow in his manly duties, uh, of course people might begin to think that that household is weak and, and begin taking advantage of them and trying to take stuff from them. Uh, but when it does actually happen, um, it's more often for the drama of the saga than for what I would call uh, legitimate marital grievances most of the time. Uh, you know, look at Njal's saga where it's kind of hard to tell why exactly maybe Hallfreder doesn't divorce Gunnar. Um, but in something like Lockstil's saga, you have Guthrun who divorces um, a husband that she doesn't like in favor of a neighbor that she does like. And uh, in order to get a reason to do so, she sews him a shirt that has a neck opening that goes below his clavicle, thus making the shirt feminine by early Norse standards, and she divorces him in front of witnesses for cross-dressing. Yes, she made him the shirt, but he still put it on and in that way uh, violated his manly role. She also gets um, her lover from another farm uh, close by to divorce his wife on the accusation that she's wearing pants and thus cross-dressing. So, that moves the saga forward, but seems like a fairly flimsy pretext for divorcing someone when you would think, um, you know, cruelty perhaps would be a more likely reason to divorce someone. But then again, maybe in the sagas as in life, uh, people are more likely to leave their partners for uh, sort of trumped up charges than for actual physical harm. Sort of a sad comment. Anyway. The Grogos law code, by the way, does define, um, which is the earliest Islamic law code, does define cross-dressing as something that you can legally divorce someone for. Uh, quote, 
from the Dennis Foot Perkins translation. If women become so deviant that they wear men's clothing or whatever male fashion they adopt in order to be different, and likewise if men adopt women's fashion, whatever form it takes, then the, the penalty for that, whichever of them does it, is lesser outlawry. The case lies with anyone who wants it, i.e. anyone can prosecute them for it, but it's also grounds for divorce. All right, now let's say that this couple has gotten married, uh, there's no divorce clouds on the horizon, and they begin having kids. Let me quote from my translation of the saga of Ragnar Lothbrok. The time came when Oslaug felt the birth pangs coming, and then she gave birth and the child was a boy. The midwives took the boy and showed her. Then she said that he should be taken to Ragnar for him to see. This was done, and the young boy was brought into the hall and laid on Ragnar's lap. When Ragnar saw the boy, they asked him what he should be named. He spoke this poem. His name will be Sigurd. This boy will make battles. They will say the son is much like both his father and mother. He will be listed prominently in the heroes of Odin's family. The boy with the snake eye will be the killer of many. Ragnar took a golden ring from his hand and gave it to the boy as a naming gift. And when Ragnar reached forward with the ring in his hand, the boy turned his back to him, and Ragnar took this as a sign that he would hate gold. Now, this is a... Uh, by the way, the reason that's a good sign is because it means he's going to fight for the sake of fighting and not just make himself rich. So what do we see here that's typical for Saga's births? When the boy is born, he's presented to the mother, the, or the child is born, he's presented to the mother, the mother inspects the child, and then the father inspects the child. Now, exposure is practiced in North Scandinavia, that is, children that are unwanted, um, perhaps because they have visible disabilities, or because the family doesn't have the means to support them at the time, um, can be left outdoors uh, to be killed by the elements, or by animals perhaps, um, before they are given a name and thus actually incorporated into the family. But after the father inspects the child, he indicates his acceptance of the child, right? This the child is being brought into the family. I accept the responsibility for raising this child by giving him a gift and a name so the, the gift is the naming gift, the gift given along with the name. And so in this case, Ragnar is naming the kid Sigurd. Quite typical to name a kid after a grandfather. Um, boys, there are almost always in a family, not, not always, almost always, there will be a boy name for uh, the grandfather, at least the paternal grandfather, and a girl name for the grandmother, a grandmother. Uh, they very often uh, stagger names across generations, so grandfathers, and grandsons will have the same name. And Sigurd is the boy's grandfather. The gift that Ragnar gives him is a golden ring. Of course, that's pretty high status, but Ragnar is a king. Uh, other times we see it being much simpler items. And we also read about a ceremony in which children are uh, splashed with water. The idiom is ausa vatni, sprinkle with water, splash with water. Uh, this may be somewhat related to baptism, um, although it is attested so widely in so many different sources referring to pre-Christian times that it seems that it probably isn't um, influenced by baptism. It seems to be perhaps a, a separately developed tradition, um, perhaps sort of ceremonially uh, washing the kid for the first time um, at, when he's admitted to the family. By the way, the exposure thing, this is another thing kind of like divorce where I suspect that more often in the sagas it is there as a source of drama than to reflect what are probably more like the real world circumstances because of course very often what you've got in the sagas is kids who are exposed but who survive because they're found by somebody else uh, this is what you get in the saga Finbogi the Strong for example or um, in the saga of Gunlaug Wormtongue uh, where Helga is supposed to be exposed uh, the father says expose this girl but the mom doesn't so the girl is brought up elsewhere it's, it's, it's a drama thing, right? It's just like uh, our movie trope of the, you know, the sort of the, the lost son, the Luke Skywalker who comes back that no one knew he was alive, that, 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 that drama. Now, that's when someone is born. What about when someone dies? What are the funeral practices? We're a little bit more informed about this than about, um, about marriage practices, perhaps. One thing to keep in mind is that a funeral is a family matter. 
There's no funeral home. There's no professional undertaker. When your loved one dies, it is your responsibility to uh, treat the corpse properly. And they pr place great stock on treating the corpse properly. Uh, for instance, the advice of uh, the Valkyrie Sigurdry or Brynhildr de Sigurdr includes um, a warning about treating corpses well. There is a ritual closing of the corpse. The eyes are closed. And uh, we also read of the mouth and nose being, quote, closed. That may mean that something is is placed in the nose and mouth, uh, at least placed in the nose and the mouth closed. Um, the body is washed, especially the face. The face may be wrapped in cloth. And as far as the ceremony goes, we, we have pretty contradictory information about this. Uh, some sagas, for instance, the saga of Gisli Sorsun, uh, have fairly detailed portrayals of uh, funeral practice, funeral ceremony. Uh, Gisli Sag includes details we don't read of elsewhere, such as hell shoes, uh, where someone has particular shoes tied on his feet uh, for the, the walk to the afterlife, uh, or the anchoring of the boat that uh, a chieftain is buried in. We don't know how common that might have been. But much like with weddings, the main thing we do know is that there's a big drinking festival. Everybody uh, has a big feast and gets, and, and, and gets drunk, probably. With the wedding, we read about someone, we read about how people draka bruthlau, they drink the wedding. And with funerals, we read how they draka ervi, drink the inheritance. It doesn't mean what it would mean today, uh, drinking, you know, drinking down all the money you've inherited on, on liquor, but rather that you were expected to have a big drinking event to mark um, this, this event, this passing. If a wedding and a funeral happen to happen at about the same time, you can actually combine the drinking, by the way. So in the uh, in Lockstilla saga, when Unnar or Alder uh, dies at her granddaughter's wedding, uh, they say, oh, how, how thoughtful of her. We don't have to have a separate drinking, <laughs> right? We just use this big drinking reception we're having for the wedding, and, and that'll also be for, for the grandmother's funeral. Now, typically people are buried the notion of a Viking funeral being uh, that someone is put onto a boat and then burned on it is based essentially on partially conflation with Beowulf, but probably mostly on the death of Baldr and his funeral. But Baldr is a god. Your average person is buried with a small mound of earth placed over them. Or perhaps the place of burial marked by uh, rocks shaped like a boat or ship that's fairly common in uh, Sweden. Cremation was apparently practiced pretty commonly in Denmark, although probably not, again, with the dramatic death of Baldr kind of cremation. Uh, much more pedestrian cremation. And uh, the body would be provided with a coffin. In big dedicated trading posts like Birka, there might actually be dedicated town cemeteries. Uh, some of these are great sources for the archaeology of the Viking Age. And you would be buried with some things we don't always know exactly why someone was buried with the things they're buried with. They may reflect that person's station in life. Um, for instance, you might have a warrior buried with weapons, or for all we know, they might be buried with weapons because those weapons belong to someone that was close to them. They might be mementos for, for the dead person rather than mementos of the dead person, if that makes sense. We don't necessarily know exactly why things are chosen to go with someone. Although, we do very frequently find dogs buried with people, and there's a fair chance that that is sentimental attachment, right? You're being buried with your, your loyal canine companion to go with you to the afterlife. Now, the afterlife is really not a subject for this daily life video, but I do have a video about that that goes into some detail about all the very contradictory afterlife notions that we see in the Viking Age. Among those, I will note that it seems like there's very early on a notion that the afterworld is across a body of water. That would seem to explain why the uh, graves are often, the grave markers are often shaped like boats or ships, and why high status people, both in the sagas and in the archeological record, are often buried in ships. In fact, some of the best preserved Viking ships, the Oseberg and the Guxna ship from Norway, uh, which you can see at the Viking Ship Museum outside Oslo, are um, ships that high-ranking people were buried in, along with massive amounts of treasure and uh, artistic works that are very important sources for the 
uh, archaeology of the Viking Age. So let's talk a little bit about food and drink and meal times. In the sagas, the interrupted meal is as much trope as it is in our TV shows, right? Someone bursts in in the middle of uh, folks having a meal to announce some big news item. And uh, for the Norse, it seems that after the time they call ris mol, that means rise time. Now one uh, brief vocabulary thing, the word mol is one of the most um, multi-faceted words in Old Norse. Uh, you may notice it in the titles of poems like Ova mol, where it means something like words or speech. But it also means a time, and from the association with particular times, it comes to also mean meal in some instances, and of course that is the English cognate of the word is meal. But rismol, rise time, is not a meal time. That's probably about 6 a.m. in the winter and about 5 a.m. in the summer. And then about three hours after that, you're going to actually eat your first meal. After, of course, when you get up, um, washing yourself, you might just wash yourself in a creek or a pond if that's nearby, or you might have uh, children or perhaps uh, slaves who get water from a well, uh, wells being usually hollowed out tree trunks. They would bring water in for uh, the people of the house to wash themselves, especially their hands and faces. Um, slave women also, it seems, were probably washing laundry right after they wake up. But anyway, about... And that would, of course, be out in, out in uh, uh, unfrozen water, maybe using uh, well water inside in the, in the cold part of the year. But anyway, two or three hours after waking up, you would have your first meal of the day, and that is called dog verder. That literally just means dog, dead dog. Literally just means day meal. Um, later uh, forms of the word uh, include dogrder. And this is probably the biggest meal of the day. Uh, this is something that's actually fairly common among um, agricultural societies or societies close to the earth that you eat a lot more in the morning because you're powering up for the day. And then, presumably, you're only just kind of picking during the day, and then there is an early evening meal after the day's work is done, and that's called the not verder, or later, not order. And then that meal is typically going to be followed by um, a bath. You bathe right after dinner. That might mean um, just washing yourself again uh, with, with well water, creek water, or if you've got access to a uh, hot spring bath in Iceland, uh, that would be the time that you would go and relax in your, uh, in your hot tub, as it were. Right? I don't want to exactly say a natural hot tub because, of course, you don't usually get right into the hot spring. That's how you get boiled to death. They typically are piping water from the hot spring into a constructed pool uh, and the length of the pipes gives it time to, to cool off. Now, as far as the tools of eating, uh, they don't have forks. That's a strange thing to think about perhaps for us, but in the Middle Ages, uh, there, there's not table forks. Uh, typically, every person carries a knife, right? They've got something that they use both to cut up their food and then to bring it up to their mouths. So, for instance, I might take my knife, cut off a little bit of this trout, and then spike it and bring it up to my mouth. Now, they eat a fair amount of soup, too. Soups and stews. Probably often that's just drunk from the bowl by tilting it up into your mouth. Um, by the way, that knife people carry, since everyone carries one for eating and cutting their food with, um, it is a distinctive part of a person's uh, appearance, because everybody probably has a fairly distinctive looking knife. There's no mass production. Your knife is probably made at home or made by somebody at, at your home, and uh, so people may recognize you by your knife, and in fact that's a fairly common trope in the sagas, where uh, for example in Njal's saga, an arsonist is recognized because he's dropped his knife on his, on his way back from um, burning a, a barn. Or in uh, Lockstilla saga, where a mother recognizes that a message is truly from her daughter because she has sent her knife along with the messenger. So in an era before mass production, you're carrying a knife that's probably part of just what people associate with, with what you look like, and people are going to recognize, you know, something about the, 
the hilt or the blade or, 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 or just some de decoration you may have added to it that's going to be distinctive. Now, as far as what they're drinking, of course, they don't have coffee. Not to make this excessively a Kathy cartoon, but that's hard to imagine. They do, of course, have plenty of alcohol. Now, ale, which they call ol, is made with barley, with hops. So perhaps not too different from beer people might be familiar with today. And there's mead, Old Norse mjolder. Now, uh, one interesting note is that this is probably brewed by the women of the house. And the beekeeping and honey gathering seems to have been a woman's job, too. Wealthy people might have wine, Old Norse vin. Of course, that's going to be imported from the south. And there's a drink called leith that is speculated to be either some kind of fruit wine, right, you might be making it with fermented berries or something like that, or a cider. But again, no coffee or tea. They, of course, also have milk, and they drink whey and buttermilk. Uh, one of the jobs of lower-class women on the farm is to milk the cows. And, of course, they also make cheese, which is a pretty storable food, um, so a big mainstay of their diet. Now consider seasonal availability for a moment. Today, even in the middle of Colorado, I can go to a country grocery store and I can get blueberries from Peru in January. They don't have anything like that. They're going to be gathering berries probably in late summer. That's when they're going to have berries. In a similar way, they're probably going to have more meat in the early fall because that's when you slaughter a lot of your animals because you don't want as many to have to feed through the winter. And in fact, um, in the old uh, month names, the month that starts in about mid-October and goes to about mid-November is called Gor Molnador, which is Gore month because of the gore of the animals you're slaughtering at that time. Now, as far as vegetables and fruits, the main cultivated vegetables would be cabbage and onions. Grown in fields, usually plowed by horses rather than cattle, another curious little little note. And of course the cultivation of hay for livestock was very important. Women and children would gather berries, blueberries, cloudberries, lingonberries, raspberries, strawberries, blackberries, and then picking fruit, probably mostly from wild trees, but well-established farms in the right places might have apple and cherry trees. Uh, pears and plums are also known. When they talk about nuts, nectar, they are mostly talking about hazelnuts. That's the main native nut in most of Scandinavia. The walnut uh, is known but is imported and probably part of only a very wealthy person's table. In fact, the name walnut, in Old Norse it's valhnot, so made from the same elements as the English word, means foreign nut. It's kind of fun. Now, fishing is also a huge part of the diet. Cod, herring, trout, salmon, pike, eel, shark. A lot of fishing. This constituted a massive part of the diet. Halibut, flounder, flatfishes. I hear the wolves howling right now. Odd time of day for them. So, actually, it's one of the main sort of default background activities people are engaging in in the sagas is fishing, whether in, uh, whether offshore or in a river. Whaling is also practiced. Um, beached whales and sharks are eaten. And, of course, uh, whale uh, blubber may be used for cook, uh, uh, cooking oil and, and oil for lights. And then fish would be preserved for harder times uh, in various different ways, perhaps by uh, smoking, as, as my trout is, or um, hanging out on kind of scaffoldings to dry. They still do this in Iceland. Um, it produces a kind of fish jerky. Or you pickle it in brine, or by salting it. They keep chickens and geese for meat and for eggs. Uh, tending the fowl seems to have been a woman's job. And then a children's job is gathering wild bird's eggs, for example, puffin eggs in a lot of Iceland. And then they probably also catch some poor wild birds in snares, uh, including puffins, to eat, which they still do in Iceland today. Now, animals you're keeping on the farm for red meat include cows, pigs, sheep, goats. Uh, sheep, of course, primarily kept for wool, which is the main fabric for uh, clothing and other textile works, including sails. In Iceland, sheep would spend the summer in the mountains. Uh, this is still a, a traditional farming practice in, in Iceland where sheep are kind of uh, drifted into the mountains for most of the summer and then recollected by their owners uh, toward the fall. 
In the sagas, we read of hunting deer, reindeer, moose, and even bear and otters for meat. Now, by the way, when I say deer, what you ought to picture if you're, if you're North American is almost like a smaller elk, what we call elk, right? Uh, there, that's, that's the red deer of Europe, which is uh, closer related, or the roe deer. Uh, I think it's red deer of Europe that's closely related to uh, our elk, but smaller. If you read European books, you will read about them hunting elk too, but remember that in European English, elk means what we call moose. So you're right to kind of picture them hunting elk, but that's what they're calling deer. It's a smaller form of our elk, and they're hunting moose too, and reindeer and otters and walrus and some other things. Hunting would mostly be done with heavy spears or with a bow, and then in snares and traps, you're probably catching things like rabbits and seals, uh, or clubbing seals, and also hunting wild boar in areas where those are present. Horses are probably eaten too in the pagan period. This is something that's often banned in early Christian law codes. Apparently, early Christians disapproved of eating horses, as do I. Although in Iceland, horses are still eaten. And based on what they still do in Iceland to this day, probably a lot more of the animal is eaten than we in our comfortable 21st century Western lives would uh, be entirely comfortable with. How are the cooking? Uh, boiling meat seems to have been a low-class pursuit. If you read uh, Rik Sula, the uh, slave family are eating boiled calf meat, presumably something pretty low-class. But roasting on a spit or baking, perhaps just baking in a pit full of hot stones, that would be how you'd prepare food for a higher status person's table. And of course, on a, on a journey, probably be roasting on an open fire. In foods buried with people from the Viking Age, we find seasonings such as cumin, kind of surprising. Uh, some people think of that kind of spice being present in the diet. Also mustard and horseradish, and of course salt from seawater. And then their bread is typically rye bread, at least on the continent, maybe more barley. Um, in Iceland, as I understand, it grows uh, better than rye there, but barley bread would on the continent be regarded as more of a poor person's food. Again, we kind of see that in Rikstula. Bread in Norse graves often has stuff mixed in with it, pine bark seeds, um, and literary sources suggest they're also probably putting butter, fairly obvious thing, but also animal fat on it to uh, add some calories. As far as who's doing the work, the baking is probably uh, the wife's job, even in fairly high status households, but the kneading of the dough is probably the work of children or slaves. They also cultivate oats, both for bread and for horses, and it's interesting to note that in spite of our expectations today, wheat is a fairly rare uh, cultivar in medieval Scandinavia. So uh, bread made with bread that would taste quite like your average supermarket bread in the United States would be a pretty high status, pretty foreign kind of item. Let's talk about clothes, grooming, hair, personal appearance, that kind of thing. Keep in mind that fashion changes. So, you know, the way that somebody dressed in 1770s America is pretty different from the way that somebody dressed in 1970s America. And then the way that somebody dresses in 2020s America is still pretty different from 1970s America. So in 50 years, in 200 years, you can see a lot of change. In 10 years, you can see some change. Probably fashion isn't changing as fast in the Viking Age, given that there's not as much mass communication, there really is no mass communication, and uh, ideas and styles aren't moving as fast from place to place. But you can still assume that somebody in Iceland in say 800 is dressed and has a different hairstyle probably than somebody in around 1000 in Iceland. Maybe not quite as drastic as things might change in, in 200 years, uh, in later centuries, but probably still some, so we're going to be dealing in generalities. Let's start with hair. The saga suggests that women wore their hair long and that it was actually a symbol of marital status. So something like how uh, a man might look for a wedding ring on a woman's finger today to see if she's uh, perhaps married. In the sagas you have men asking women if they're really unmarried because their hair is flowing freely. Apparently, um, just free-flowing hair is an indication of a single woman, 
but tying the hair into some kind of knot in the back of her head is an indication that the woman is married. Now, men probably have shorter hair. Certainly when men have really, really long hair, shoulder length or longer, it is remarked on. The fact that it's remarked on suggests that it's unusual. So, uh, you know, you if you have really long hair like that, it probably actually is your nickname. Something like Harold Fairhair, of course, or Olv Afterkemba, Olv Slickback, who has really long slickback hair. Um, it seems... It, it, it seems pretty unusual, probably because it's pretty impractical for men working hard on the farm or fighting to have long hair that could be grabbed by somebody else that can get caught in something. Um, but in the sagas, it is also often a characteristic of men who are relatively, quote-unquote, dreamy, uh, someone like Gunnar and Njal Saga. So it might also have been looked at that way, at least at certain times, uh, among Norse women. So it seems like probably men are mostly keeping their hair probably about above their collar. Of course, it's much harder to keep it really short uh, in an age before um, tremors, but they're not going to be wearing it real, real, real long. And one kind of fun thing that I think is not often reflected in uh, Norse movies and TV, although the uh, outlaw Utlayan movie from Iceland is an exception, is that men probably kept their hair back off their faces with what we would describe as lame hippie headbands, probably made of leather or cloth. Now, facial hair on men seems to have been basically a social requirement. When men are not bearded, I think they're the wolves again. How in mid-morning these couple days? Huh. Um, anyway, what was I saying? Men are typically bearded. When they don't have beards, they're made fun of, like Njal and Njal Saga, uh, who's gotten so old that his beard isn't growing anymore. Um, beards are part of the visual separator of what are legally boys and legally adult men. So it's a major uh, indication of, if you will, citizenship of the rights and responsibilities of, of being a, a full citizen. And uh, I also ought to point out that men are described as handsome in, a, in uh, proportion to a trimmed, or often they use the term sharp beard. So you probably ought not to picture the kind of ZZ top beard that certain Viking reenactors and, and such today often wear. It's probably not, it's probably quite a bit longer than I ever grow, but still shaped into a point and not enough that you could grab onto or that it's gonna get caught in a shirt or in chain mail or something like that. So medium length, probably fairly trimmed, and that's the kind of beard that we see on uh, archeological uh, depictions of men, such as the uh, faces on the uh, Oseberg cart. I'll briefly mention tattoos at this point, mostly just to say, probably not. The only medieval source that points to the Norse having tattoos is Ibn Fadlan, who describes them as being tattooed all over their bodies. But of course, he's talking about one group, the Rus, who are not even in Scandinavia, they're in modern day Kazan, Russia, and could have been mixed with many other peoples they had met along their way. There is just nothing in finds in Scandinavia or in Old Norse literature to suggest that anybody's got tattoos. In fact, there's not an Old Norse word for tattoo. Um, the modern Icelandic word is tattoo, which is borrowed from the same Polynesian source as the word tattoo is in, in most other European languages. So, very unlikely that they have tattoos. The Norse are probably very clean for early medieval people. Uh, it's a famous fact that in Old Norse, the word for Saturday is laugardagr, day of bath. Uh, and of course, that continues in modern Scandinavian languages, Norwegian Irorsk, laugardag, Norwegian Bukmol, laugardag, etc. And it's also kind of fun to read that in 907, when the Byzantine emperor signed a treaty of friendship with five Rus leaders, that uh, part of what they demanded in Constantinople was unlimited baths. So apparently the Vikings had uh, had a desire for more bathing than your average person did uh, at this time period. We also see Old English sermons by priests railing against English women for running off with these Vikings who are, you know, bathing and trimming their beards and such, combing their hair. But if they were very clean, uh, in medieval European eyes, they did not apparently impress uh, Ibn Fadlan, at least, again, 
the roost did not impress Ibn Fadlan as he complains about them all washing their faces in the same bowl of water into which they also spit and blow their noses. Of course, um, standards of cleanliness in a medieval Arabic society would often involve uh, the cleanliness of water. It's possible the Norse just didn't care about that particular detail very much, but still it disgusted him. Now before I get into the details of clothes, let me recommend two sources where you can get um, A, better information, and then pictures. A, better information, uh, the book that is considered the standard by scholars in this field is Viking Clothing, that's the name of the book, by Thor Ewing. Very good book, very comprehensive, uh, makes use of a lot of sources, archaeological, artistic, uh, literary, uh, less literary than I'm, than I'm kind of obligated to follow. Uh, that's an excellent book, so I can highly recommend it. My second recommendation, if you want good pictures and, and some more good information, is um, the website hurstwitch.org. I don't know these people. I don't know anything about them. Uh, the website has been along, around for a very long time. Uh, possibly they wouldn't like me recommending them. I have no idea. Like I said, I don't know them or know anything about them. But they have really worked hard on getting the material culture right. And their website is, as far as I can tell, a very good source uh, for this stuff and has great pictures, very importantly. So check that out if you want to get um, a little bit more information. And, and of course, both the Viking Clothing Book and the Hurstwitch site, which is by very dedicated reenactors, um, are produced by people who, unlike me, know something about clothes, right? I mean, you know, I've never sewn anything but my own skin. Don't ask. Uh, and I buy all my clothes off a of rack. So... With all that said, how do we know anything about their clothes? One is archaeological finds, although textiles, right, fabrics, don't survive very well over the lengths of time that we're talking about, a thousand years or so, and often the only fabric that will survive is fabric that's in contact with metal, such as the parts of dresses and cloaks that are right next to um, the metal brooches that hold them up. Then there's artistic representations of Viking Age Scandinavians, whether they are from Scandinavia, like the Oseberg cart, um, other finds of the Oseberg burial, or um, the uh, Lewis Chessmen are very late Viking Age, but they have, that could be considered a source uh, from Scandinavia, at least the Scandinavian sphere of influence. And then there is saga literature in which characters' clothing is described. However, saga literature is going to lean toward describing um, high status clothes and can be distorted by the later centuries in which the sagas are written down. Right, look at the way that Renaissance artists tend to draw Greeks as dressed like Renaissance Italians. One thing to keep in mind, too, is that people probably don't have much clothes. If you're a slave or a very poor person, you probably basically have one set of clothes. And um, and, and you're just going to wear that till it, till it wears out. People of means probably have several sets. Uh, it's certainly notable that when people show up at someone's door asking for hospitality, as they often do in the sagas, that they are very often offered fresh, dry clothes. So there must be some extra clothes on hand, and, and again, houses of means. And of course, Hall of Mall in 3 and 4 recommends uh, offering dry clothes to a guest. Clothing would mostly be made out of wool. Of course, they raise a lot of sheep. Uh, there is some use of linen made from flax, though, in underclothes, if you're lucky enough to have underclothes. And of course, fur in things like coats and cloaks. Leather trim is often used, apparently. And uh, in terms of colors, the, they do have the ability to, to make several dyes, although dyes are pretty expensive. So uh, blue, apparently, was the really high status dye, most expensive color to dye. Green, red, uh, also being expensive dyes. And when people are described as being in colored clothing, that is generally an indication of uh, wealth because, of course, they can afford uh, to spend the time, spend the money, getting their wool colored something different than what the sheep was colored. Um, it's interesting that in um, the stories of the Norwegian kings, of course, there is Harold Greycloak, who was called that because he wears just a common man's gray cloak, not something that's dyed to show off his influence and wealth. As far as what furs are available, um, the prized furs seem to be bear, otter, and marden. Um, in fact, the uh, Sami people are often taxed in uh, just such pelts. 
women would be wearing um, probably two layers fundamentally, a long underdress made of wool or of linen for comfort in warmer temperatures, and then a shorter overdress, which would be held up with a leather or cloth belt tied at the waist. From that belt, uh, she would have a, uh, her, her eating knife hanging, as well as probably a small leather bag for her possibles. If she is a married woman who is the, uh, uh, the, 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 the lady of the house, she'll probably also have keys hanging either from her belt or possibly from the brooches that hold her overdress up. Women wear two uh, often oval uh, brooches, four or five inches long, at their shoulders, which connect the straps from the back of the overdress to the straps from the front of the overdress. And these oval brooches are called dvergar, dwarves, for reasons that might be intended to be humorous, kind of like how dwarves hold up the bull of the sky, the dwarves hold up the dress, I don't know. Men also would wear linen underclothes if they were lucky. Uh, I understand that in Greenland, which is a great archaeological icebox, there are men's underclothes found that actually even have drawstrings to keep them, uh, underpants with drawstrings to keep them up. Uh, men are going to be wearing uh, wool pants as well as often wool hose, uh, something like uh, later hosen or, or, or long socks, which will often be tied outside of the pants um, and then tied up with leather straps. And then he will likely have a knee-length shirt. You can use the term tunic for that. Um, this is called in Old Norse the kirtil, obviously related to English kirtle. The neckline is fairly high above the clavicle, at least as uh, the divorce court and Lockstilla saga uh, suggests. And like uh, a woman's dress, the man's shirt is probably bound with a leather or cloth belt at his waist from which hangs his, um, his knife for eating and other purposes and his small leather bag for his possibles. Men in the sagas also often wear a knife around the neck. Um, when they do, those seem to be knives that have some kind of greater sentimental meaning, something that was passed down perhaps from a, uh, from a family member. And they may have very decorated belt buckles. Uh, archaeological finds show belt buckles with gripping beasts and other cool designs. Over his shirt or tunic, a man is going to wear a coat or a cloak. If it's a cloak, it's fastened at the right shoulder so that his right arm is freer than his left arm. If he wears a sword, which a man of very high status would, that is going to be uh, hanging from a shoulder strap down to his waist rather than from the belt. If his coat or cloak is not made of fur or wool, but just of skin, that is apparently a uh, sign of very low status. So men are made fun of um, for wearing just skin cloak, skin felder. Shoes, very simple, flat, uh, without a distinct heel area, just one flat sole. Uh, often leather, often ankle high. The sagas often mention tying shoes at dramatic points. Njal saga has a chase that's interrupted by having to tie a shoe. Thorstein's, uh, Thorstein stick beat story has a duel that's interrupted by uh, shoe tying. And then wearing wool or fur hats that we would probably describe as kind of a Russian style. Now I said at the beginning of this video that I'm not an archaeologist and I think that's fairly clear from the way that I've treated these subjects. I am relying on inferences from Old Norse literature. I am relying on, of course, my secondary reading and archaeological uh, source texts, and I'm relying to some degree on inferences from rural life as I know it. Now, does that mean that I might be projecting things onto Norse society that uh, weren't there? Yes, that's possible, but I think it's less dangerous the way that I'm doing it, because at least I'm projecting a reality and not projecting my fantasy onto it. I am not someone, as I've stated before, who is trying to be a Viking or tell you how to be a Viking. I'm not a reenactor or anything like that. Um, I am only interested in spreading information and reasonable inferences from information on my channel and in my books. So at least if I'm projecting again, I hope I'm projecting a reality of some kind rather than a fantasy. And for the most part, I don't think I'm projecting. If I am projecting fantasies, probably those fantasies are the fantasies of the saga authors, because being a language and text person, I rely quite a bit on 
Old Norse literature, as I said. And the sagas probably do reflect, just like our westerns do, a pretty glorified and slightly anachronistic picture of the Viking Age. If you want to get a sense for the culture in the sagas, though, one thing that really surprises me is that so many people who are fascinated, they say, by Norse culture, myth, etc., the Vikings in general, have never read a saga. I'm amazed how many times I meet someone who, who tells me how wild they are about the, about the Vikings, and I say, well, you know, what have you read in the sagas? And they'll often sheepishly say something like, oh, well, you know, I tried to read Njal's saga, but I couldn't, I couldn't finish it. And their literature is somewhat alien to us, but I think people do themselves a disservice by trying to read those long, huge masterpiece sagas first. Start with a short saga. I might recommend the saga of Gunlaug Wormtongue, the saga of Ravenkel Froisgothi, the saga of Bjorn, the champion of the people of Heterdal, the saga of Cormac, the saga of Finbogi the Strong. Some of these are translated in uh, the Penguin Sagas of Isinger's book. Uh, others are translated in the book Sagas of Warrior Poets. I haven't translated any of these. And many of those translations suffer from a problem I often complain about, where translators try to make things sound too archaic in English. Uh, instead of writing in, in, in plain English, it's similar to the plain Norse of the sagas. But at any rate, they can give you a little bit of a taste, more, I would say, than just about anything else you could start reading. Although the Saga of the Volsungs will give you some of that flavor, and I have translated that, the Saga of the Volsungs is, is so mythical in nature that it won't give you the same approach to daily life that any of the sagas of Icelanders will. Well, for now, I hope this video has satisfied the many Patreon supporters who asked for it and voted on it. And since I started this video with a quote from, or not a quote from, but I started this video by referencing Red Green, let me end this video by wishing you all the best and saying that if the women don't find you handsome, they ought to at least find you handy. <laughs> from beautiful Colorado, all the best. The whole point of this video channel, the whole point of my books, is to bring good information about these subjects to the people who want it, in the places where they're looking for it, online. Otherwise, the people who know what they're talking about are all trying to impress each other, talking to each other in the ivory tower, and they're never reaching out to the public. The people who are reaching out to the public on YouTube or wherever else mostly are scared, angry people sh trying to, to, to spread centuries-old cartoonish uh, racialist theories and, and crazy mysticism that has nothing to do with our medieval sources. I want to bring good information about our real medieval sources straight to you in the places where you're looking for it without an agenda, without trying to set myself up as some ivory tower super genius who's better than you. You can help me do that by donating small monthly amounts on my Patreon. And everyone who does that has my everlasting thanks for your incredible generosity and the way that you help me make a university of uh, my favorite place in the world, the Great Rocky Mountain Outdoors. Well, from now, from the middle of beautiful Colorado, let me wish you good thinking, good skepticism, and all the very best.